This is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for the Real News Network from Montreal, Canada. A new study by leading scientists has concluded that by 2100, sea levels could rise to a far greater level than previously estimated. Sea level rise of such a magnitude would have devastating consequences for humanity, particularly for the tens of millions of persons who live in low-lying coastal regions. The study, entitled Ice Sheet Contributions to Future Sea Level Rise from Structured Expert Judgment, was published on May 20th, 2019 in the Proceedings of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Until this study, the prevailing and long-held view has been that seas would rise by a maximum of just under one meter by 2100. This new study, based on expert opinions, projects that sea level rise could be more than double that figure. Now here to discuss this study with us is one of its co-authors, Dr. Roger M. Cook. Dr. Cook is a Chauncey Star Senior Fellow at Resources for the Future. His research has widely influenced risk assessment methodology, particularly in the areas of expert judgment and uncertainty analysis. He's recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on mathematical modeling of risk and uncertainty. And he joins us today from Washington, DC. Thank you for coming on to The Real News, Dr. Cook. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Cook, before we talk about the findings of the study, could you please to explain to us uh, a little bit uh, the methodology of the uh, study that, uh, the, that you and your co-authors employed? As I understand it, this is a structured expert judgment study. Uh, what does that mean for laypersons? Okay, um, we interviewed in total 22 experts, roughly half of them in the United States and the other half in Europe. And the experts quantified their uncertainty with regard to the physical processes that are driving the behavior of the ice sheets. And uh, the unique thing about a structured expert judgment study like this one is that experts are also asked to quantify their uncertainty about variables from their field to which they don't know the answers, but to which the answers become known after the fact. And from that sort of information, we can judge how well experts are able to quantify their uncertainty. And we use that information in combining the expert judgments. Uh, you know, as I indicated in my introduction, uh, the authors, you and your co-authors concluded that a glo global total sea level rise exceeding two meters could occur by 2100. What in your estimation is the probability that a sea level rise of that magnitude will occur, occur by the end of the century? So the elicitation uh, concerned two temperature scenarios, a low scenario stabilizing at two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial and a high scenario stabilizing at five degrees above pre-industrial. And the five degree scenario corresponds roughly with business as usual. So there is no climate policy to limit emissions. Whereas the two degree scenario roughly corresponds to the Paris Agreement. So if we look at the uh, business as usual scenario, then we would say on the basis of our study that there is about a 5% chance that the sea level rise would exceed two meters in 2100. And broadly speaking, uh, Dr. Cook, what would the world look like uh, if, we were, if we were to experience a sea level rise of that magnitude? Well, it would be a catastrophe. First of all, remember that it doesn't stop in 2100. It keeps going. So, but if we just focus on the 2100 result, that means that about 187 million people would be displaced. It means that all of the low-lying cities in, on the world would be stressed to one degree or another. So local sea level differs from the mean sea level and it can differ quite a lot from one region to another. But all of our major population centers that are located on the coast, think New York, Los Angeles, uh, Rio de Janeiro, London, Shanghai, on and on and on. They would all be stressed. That means they will have to make enormous expenditures to defend their coastline and probably have to start moving inland. And, and as, uh, as, 
as we know, the, the Syrian war caused uh, uh, an immigration, uh, an outflow of uh, desperate migrants in the range of, I think, about 10 million persons. That had quite uh, destabilizing effects throughout the Middle East and even into Europe. Uh, one can only imagine uh, the consequences uh, politically uh, in terms of global conflict if we were to see uh, tens of millions of climate refugees forced to leave coastlines and in search of a stable, uh, a stable environment. Yeah, that's correct. And we're talking about a displacement of some 187 million people. But I emphasize it doesn't stop in 2100. The seas will keep rising. And the situation will be a continuous, slow-moving, continuous crisis. And, and could you explain to us briefly, and I think this may get back to the question of methodology, why this study's estimate of maximum sea level rise is so much higher than the previous widely accepted estimate? Well, uh, the IPCC, in their estimates, focuses on what they call the likely range. And that means mathematically uh, the range between the 17th and the 83rd percentile. Uh, and our results focus on the tails of these distributions as well. That's one significant difference. Another difference is the methodology which is employed by the ICCC, IPCC, which uh, has a long and not too glorious history. Uh, it is called the BOGSAT method, which means a bunch of guys or gals sitting around a table. That's how they quantify their uncertainty by these sorts of processes. Uh, this sort of methodology was used in the US in the late 60s, early 70s, in particular by the defense intelligence agencies in combination with this calibrated language where you can say if you're to, if you think there's a two thirds probability, it will be between here and here. You can say that's uh, the likely range. Okay, so you have these verbal qualifiers to communicate your uncertainty to a lay public, and this method of communicating uncertainty was also abandoned by the U.S. defense intelligence agencies in the 70s because these probabilistic statements are not verified. In addition to that, we know from lots of uh, psychological research that people are not good at quantifying their uncertainty and that we are subject to many sorts of cognitive biases and everybody knows this, but uh, the structured expert judgment methodology is explicitly designed to guard against these cognitive biases. And the way in which we do that is to ask experts to quantify their uncertainties about things to which we know the real answers from their field, very important. There's two things that are important. One is catching the true values with the appropriate relative frequencies. And the other is having tight uncertainty bands. It's not very useful just to be enormously uncertain. That won't really give you a very good score, but it's also not very helpful. What we need are tight uncertainty bands that capture the true values with the appropriate relative frequencies. And we need a demonstration that our methodology is able to produce that. Now, this methodology makes a very serious attempt to regard the expert uncertainty quantifications as real scientific data, which is subject to validation just like any other scientific process. And that's the main distinction between this methodology and other methodologies. Let me stop there. And finally, Dr. Cook, uh, three days before the publication of your study, interestingly, the Guardian newspaper announced that it had updated style guide uh, to introduce terms that it says more accurately describe the crises uh, facing the world environmentally. Instead of climate change, the Guardian's preferred terms will now be climate emergency, uh, crisis, or breakdown. In, in, in view of this and uh, the more recent uh, scientific analyses uh, where we're heading in terms of uh, climate change, do you feel that that's an appropriate change in the terminology and that we should be talking today 
in the world in which we currently live of a climate crisis rather than the more neutral and less uh, concerning term climate change. Yes, I do think it's appropriate to start talking in terms of emergency and uh, whereby we have to emphasize that these predictions are not certain. These have a relatively low probability of occurrence, but you have to take those sorts of things into account when you are planning. Let me give you a very simple uh, comparison. If you are about to put your children on an airplane and the authorities say, well, it's very likely that this airplane is okay, but there is a 5% chance that it will crash. Now, would you put your children on that airplane? I think not. So just saying what you think is likely is not enough. And in order to take decisions, we have to see that we are facing a problem of decision under risk. And so I think in that respect, this shift of terminology that you identified at The Guardian might be helpful. But we must not fall into the trap of thinking that we know for certain what's going to happen. Well, we've been speaking to Dr. Roger M. Cook about a new study of which he is a co-author, uh, estimating that sea level rise by 2100 could be substantially greater than previously estimated. Thank you very much for joining us on The Real News, Dr. Cook. Thank you for having me. And this is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for The Real News Network.